You roofied your sister. Correct. I don't think I've ever heard those words come out of anyone's mouth. So can you give some context? (laughs) Here's the thing. I thought I was doing a good thing. Okay. Because in my, this is when I was 18 years old. And it is, to be honest, the most probably up there with the, in the most shameful things I've ever done. It's kind of amazing too, in a way. Yeah, in a way. I mean, it's amazing because um, she, she turned out okay. 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 Nothing happened. Nothing bad happened to her. I don't think I could live with myself if, if it went south, but it didn't. She ended up having an amazing night. But long story long, <laughs> my grandma. Okay. Wait. <laughs> okay. Hold on. Let's back up. So I'm 18. I, I, when I, okay, I'm not 18. I'm not 18 right now. When I was at, we can cut all that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So I moved here to LA when I was 17. When I was 18, my sister moved along with me because she was like, you're this kid here by yourself. Let me come protect you. And so my mom uh, calls us and lets us know that my grandma passed away. So we're really bummed out and we're like, this is horrible. Let's go to the nearest bar and get wasted and just like forget about everything because we're in so much pain. So we go to, have you heard of the Mondrian? Yes. Right. Yeah. The Mondrian. Yes. That was the spot back then. That was the spot, yeah, was you the spot. know, yeah. but it was like very much covered with like young, broke, hot girls and like old sleazy motherfuckers. Like, right. Wasn't it? And it was it like, so- sounds like all of LA. Yeah. Basically all of LA. So it's like, you knew there were these spots you could go if you didn't have a lot of money, but you wanted free drinks. And like the Mondrian was one of those spots where, you, you know, my sister and I didn't have any money and we wanted to get drunk. So we went there. And of course, these two guys who were actually in their thirties. So they were like old to us then, which is like really sad, isn't it? Like that we're getting old. Yeah, no, it's. I'm. I'm Does thinking of those days. I'm thinking of those days. I remember seeing those old 35 year old guys. Do you now know like, oh. you? Now, yeah, right? well, now and I'm now like, it's like us. Yeah. <laughs> we are those old 35 year old guys. That's depressing. It's really sad. So you're at the laundry. So. I- <laughs> Yes. Maybe I'll go to the Mondrian this afternoon. Yeah. You know oh it. my God. It'll Stop. take you back. Anyway, so they, they these guys end up buying us drinks. And then they were like, hey, do you want to go out to dinner with us? And we say, yes. We go to this place called Dan. I think it was Dan Tana's. It's an like iconic place. Old school, like steakhouse. This was my pre vegan days. So I'm sure I ordered a bloody ass steak. And um, yeah, dude, they, they pulled out this drug, this like, little water bottle thing and they were like hey do you want to do some ghb and i was like what's that and they were like oh it's awesome like it just makes you feel so good your whole body and i was like amazing yes like if it if someone offered me drugs it was like yes it's gonna make me feel good yes thank you i'll take two you know and then my sister was like oh no i'm good and then like five minutes later, she's like, um, I'm going to go to the restroom. And when she goes, the two guys were like, hey, we should put like a little bit in her champagne and it'll be so great. She's going to love it. And my naive um, addict mind was like, that's a great idea. Like <laughs> She's going to love this. She's going to thank me later. She's going to love this. Like I thought I was doing her a favor. And I don't even want to like justify it because it's a horrible thing that I did. But I'm just trying to tell you where my brain was at at the time. And so I thought that it was a good idea. So we put a little bit in her drink. She comes back. She drinks the champagne. And um, about 20 minutes later, we're like, okay, we're going to go out to some club. I can't remember which club. Les <sighs> Doux. Oh, man. Element. Oh, my God. Les Doux. Les oh, Doux. stop. You're taking me back. I don't think it was that, but it was like one of those. One of those where like Leonardo DiCaprio was and still is. He's okay? still there. In a sweater so hoodie. He's still there. Oh, he's never left. He's and never. guess what? You know what's never left? The same age girl oh. is still the same age. That he's so there with. Because like he was amazing. And then he, now he's just like this old dude who's like still I, he, with 20 year olds. In like a hoodie. Yeah. Hoodie. I don't, I don't like. So you guys didn't go to the club. Yeah. So 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 they're like, okay, or we're going to this club. And I'm like, this is going to be great. And my sister's like, mm, I'm actually getting, I'm actually feeling a bit tired. So I'm going to go home. And we were like, oh, okay. So we drive her home. She gets out. And one of the guys goes, oh, man, it didn't work. 
And Colleen, my sister, turns around and goes, what didn't work? And I and I was like, oh, we put we put GHB in your drink. <laughs> and she was like, you asshole, like and sort of laughed and walked in like she she didn't she wasn't even that phased because that's how reckless I was at the time that she was just like, you, you dick and like walked in. Cut to the next day, she tells me she had like the time of her life. Her and her girlfriend went out dancing that night. Like they went to see some like live band and had so much fun. She's like, it was an amazing night. And we, you know, went back safe. So, um, so yeah, but that's the story of me drugging my sister. And what happened to you? Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're getting you right didn't, into it. You didn't it. write about that, I don't think. I did. Well, the only oh, well, you did write about yes, that. I did. The, okay. the only reason I yes, ask I is because I'm starting to think like, okay, if you both took this dose that she was fine, she did that, but oh, then yeah. like, you go peel I d- off. I, I didn't tell you what happened yeah. to her. I forgot to tell you that. Yeah, so mine's fucked up. I, I basically got like sexually assaulted. Oh, okay. Which I know, <laughs> yeah. but that's okay. It's time. I've, I've processed it. It's okay. It's in my book. Um, but my, and I think it's karma. <laughs> it's karma for druggy mice. No, I know that's dark. It's, no, it's dark. But basically long story long, we, we go out to this club and go back to the guy's apartment. And, um, I just remember waking up in the morning. This is sick. This is getting really dark, really fast, but I basically wake up in the morning in this guy's apartment and he's literally like, dude, this is so fucked up. But he's like jacking off like over my face. Like I I was passed out asleep. Do you think that he wanted he you just to like, stay <gasps> asleep for that? <sighs> yeah, it was so fucked. Oh, do you think he wa- like wanted you to wake up or do you think he wanted you to stay asleep or do you think he didn't know? Oh, I think he wanted me to stay asleep. I think he probably it was like a power thing. I mean... You know, I was completely out and I just wake up to this like disgusting fucking dude jacking off on my face. You say in your book that that things like this ha- happened to you throughout when you were using and you say that it's amazing to you how quickly in the moment fight or flight you sort of know how to get out of these situations. Yeah, things there's been a couple incidences like that and um and this, like I say in my book, it was pre Me Too movement. Yeah. So we didn't talk about it. We oftentimes like blamed ourselves. Well, what, why was I there? If I wasn't there, this wouldn't have happened. We certainly didn't report anything to the police. Like we just didn't then. I or or it was not. It was very rare. So what do your instincts so, tell you to do so, when he's beating his meat mm-hmm. in your face? Yeah. So, so literally, I pop my eyes open and I see this really disturbing uh, image. And immediately my brain went, okay, if he's capable of sexually assaulting me while I'm passed out, what else is he capable of? Will he hurt me? Will he kill me? Will he rape me? Um, Potentially, potentially, and potentially. Right. So if he's capable of that, oh, okay, I need to stop doing that. (laughs) No, you That's literally what I saw. It was so horrible. Um, But if he's capable of that, what else is he capable of? And so... That was initially where my brain went. And then I knew that I couldn't fight him off. He was much bigger than me. And so my brain went to just pretend that it's okay so you can get out safely. So I just like laid there and like let it happen and and didn't fight him off because my instinct said if I tried, it could get really dangerous. Like he could have knocked me out. Is he like finishing on you? Yeah. So you just lay there and get I just lay there and just like let it happen out of... For self-preservation. I wanted to live. And I truly felt my instinct said, if you fight this guy, he'll win. And I don't have anyone there. My sister's not there. There's this other dude who's even bigger. Nobody knows you're there. Yeah. Wait, no, so, but, but, I'm in this room. Uh, but I want to get out alive. So how, did, how does finish, he have, and then I'm out. But, but how did, what does he say after that? Does he not even acknowledge it? Just... Thanks for last night. Yeah, that it's funny, like what you remember and what you don't. You don't. I don't remember the small talk. I don't remember. He was probably like, oh, yeah, that was amazing. Like he probably said something like that. And, you know, not really aware. It's like when I pop my eyes open, you would think that maybe he would stop and go, oh, my God, what am I doing? I'm sorry. I couldn't help myself or say something. But he just like kept going. And it was at that moment when I when I popped my eyes open and he continued assaulting me, um, even though he could see that I, I could now see him, 
that I knew this man was so disconnected, probably still on a lot of drugs too, which also made me right. think like he's not in his right mind and that he, if he's sexually frustrated or whatever and I get in his way, like, will he kill me basically is what I was thinking. That makes I didn't, sense. I didn't know them enough to know that I was safe and I clearly wasn't safe. So he literally finished and I like got up and got my stuff and just ran out. I just left. I one, said, I gotta go. <laughs> one of the things that I like love yeah. about you and your books, it, she reminds me of Khalil. Our friend is, does this too, is that you talk about all these things that are normally quote unquote shameful mm. and it takes the energy out of it for other people to talk about. I mean, you talk yeah. about giving birth on Facebook. You talk about postpartum. You talk yeah. about sexual assault, addiction. Yeah. There's this These books, both of them, you guys, are so good because you just take the energy out of it sometimes you read a biography yeah and they leave out like all these yeah. parts and you're just yeah. like because I'm, I'm gonna call someone out sharon stone okay lover yeah how many stories do you think she has like that treasure probably chest. a lot okay so i read her autobiography and it, it's like flat and you know yeah. her life hasn't been flat yes there's so much she could share yeah. and i think ultimately help people yeah and she didn't yeah with yours you went there yeah I love that about you I found the same thing thank you and I found the same thing with the Tom Petty documentary I don't know if you saw that but he left out his <laughs> heroin addiction like he was a junkie and he left that entire part out and I was like oh that's really sad because that could have helped a lot of people well, too. it's a huge part of the story yeah. yeah but I think maybe it's just a different time and now, you know, yeah, right. They're used to covering it. And also, yeah. I think, too, and you say this in your book, too, it's like the casting director used to make the decision. So if Ooh. the casting director doesn't like you, they have the opportunity to puppeteer your career. Whereas yes. with what you do now, you're the creator of your future. Yes. Yes. Which is awesome. Exactly. So I could write a song about buttholes if I want. And I could and I have and I have and I'll do it again. Good. And literally, it actually, <laughs> I literally wrote a song about buttholes. And um, can you give us like a jingle? It's like, buttholes are nothing to be laughed at. <laughs> They're just a part of the human body. Anus. Taylor's butthole is something to be laughed at. Let me tell you. <laughs> if, if his butthole pops up in the show back there, I'm going to, I'm out. <laughs> okay. I'm so yeah. you said, you mentioned this is before the Me Too movement. When did you notice a shift with all of this stuff in Hollywood, especially? Well, definitely like the Harvey Weinstein stuff. Yeah, that that, that made a big difference. Yeah, I feel like that. that's when it, right? I mean, I guess it probably was happening before too, but I feel like that's when it really... Well, like if, so, if it could happen to somebody in that position of power that rapidly and that dramatically yeah. and so effectively, it's like everybody else is like, hey, you better be on point. Totally. Yeah. Yes, yes. Was your journey with addiction something where it was like quick and fast and hard or was it something that slowly happened that you didn't even notice that all of a sudden it's like a tumbleweed and it's like a huge problem? Um. Well... I guess, okay, they say this very cliche saying in AA, which is it's fun and then it's fun with problems and then it's just problems. And I found that to be very true for me. So like in high school, when I started, you know, I would smoke weed with my friends on the weekend. Can, and like, can you give me context of where you grew up? Yeah. So I grew up um, 10 miles west of Chicago okay. in a place called Downers Grove, okay. which is happier than it sounds. It's a, it's a nice suburb right outside of the city. Okay. And... Um, addiction just runs in my family. So, you know, my dad's like, here's 20 bucks, go get me some weed when I'm 14, 15, you know, like it was just okay in my house to drink and smoke weed and whatever. There wasn't a lot of structure, a lot of love, especially for my mom. She loved us to death, but um, it was a little chaotic too. But um, so I started like drinking and using in high school and then like eventually found other drugs like cocaine and ecstasy, molly, whatever you want to call it. And then it just kind of progressed from there. And then I actually am really grateful that I discovered cocaine because it's such a hardcore drug. You can't just do cocaine like sporadically and be fine. I mean, I guess some people do, but I couldn't. And I feel like it, it, um, brought me to my knees quicker. It made me hit my bottom. What age is this you find it? So 
Um, I found it when I was like 16, but I would, I actually would do it here and there. But then that was like my drug of choice. Um, when I moved out here, it was just the one that I became addicted like to. 18? 18? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And um, by 22, I realized that I was putting like drugs and alcohol be- before my career um, and before my passion. And I just had this moment of clarity that if I didn't get sober, if I didn't stop drinking and using, I was never going to reach my potential. And I knew I had a lot to give. Like since I was a kid, I always wanted to make people laugh on a big scale. That was always my obsession. It, like as a kid, I was a class clown. I was straight C's and D's in school, but it was all about like, how can I make every kid in this class piss themselves from laughter? Like, how can I do that? And I was obsessed with it and I was really good at it. And so I knew I was going to do comedy. And like, so I wrote a letter to SNL when I was like nine, like, dear SNL, I'm going to make your show so funny. Love Laura. You know, like I just (laughs) always knew it was like one of those things. I wonder if Lauren Michael ever got it. I don't know. But, um, (laughs) but anyway, so it, um, So then at like 22, 23 is when I first saw that I was putting drugs and alcohol before my passion. And for me to not achieve my potential and do what I love for a living was to die. Like I just knew I had a lot to give and this is what made me happy. And I could see that drugs and alcohol were getting in the way. So that was my moment of clarity. It wasn't a um, physical, you know, people talk about hitting rock bottom. They're on skid row. I wasn't, I had, I had an apartment. I was booking independent films, um, tons of commercials, bad sitcoms. Like I was a working actor before I was, um, on social media and I was making just enough to pay my rent and, you know, uh, eat food just enough. Is it like one of those things where you're waking up and drinking or is it like just when you drank, it was like extreme, like could go for five days that that I was a binge drinker and it wasn't even ever five days, but it was just when I did drink. And that's another misconception of alcoholism. People think if you're not waking up and drinking, maybe you don't have a problem. That's not true. I would even go like a month without to do like a cleanse or something. Um, But when I did drink, I, I struggled to stop. And then by the end, when I did pick up a drink, I, and I never drink in the morning, you know, but when I did have that first drink, it was really hard to not have the second and then the third. And for me, I then wanted like harder drugs. Like I craved cocaine and that brought me to my knees quicker, like made me hit my bottom quicker was the drugs. So when you have your epiphany, do you immediately go into rehab? Do you go to AA? Like what's, what was your plan when you had the epiphany? I had that epiphany and then I ignored it and probably continued on for a little bit. Um, but I would say like my first, okay, my, my first time of going into the rooms of AA was, I, and I write about this in my first book, was I was um, in a long-term relationship with this German guy named Rudolf. You remember Rudolf? I remember yes. Rudolf. So he was like a good influence on me. Although now looking back, kind of weird, like 17 years older, I was 18. He was 37. So what I thought was like a good influence. Now I look back and I'm kind of like, hmm, that's a little creepy. That's a little Leonardo DiCaprio, right? Like 18 and 37. It's a big difference. But nonetheless, he was like very healthy and like helped me get my first commercial agent was like very um, encouraging to me and, you know, didn't use drugs and like introduced me to yoga and like taught me how to cook and to wake up early and to meditate. And so he was a good influence in a lot of ways. But towards the end, he wanted to get married and have kids. And we had been together a couple of years. So maybe this is around 22. We had been together a couple of years and I just did, I was not ready to to get married and have kids. Um, He was. So instead of like having an adult conversation with him and saying, hey, I want to break up because I don't want to get married and have kids right now. And you do. I decided to go to a bar and I met this like random Irish guy at the bar. And he was like, hey, do you want to go to Mexico? And I was like, yes, yes, I do. (laughs) So we literally, and this is the, how dangerously impulsive I was in my addiction. um, And also my inability to like um, have confrontation and things like that. I was just running away rather than having adult conversations, right? So instead of breaking up with him, I drove to Mexico with this random Irish guy. I met at a bar that day. 
fucking drove there. Like you went to like like TJ oh, or Rosa? Tijuana. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Literally went to Tijuana. I was gonna I thought he was like escorting you down to like Puerto Vallarta or Cabo or like Nope. Tijuana. We drove. Okay. Yep. Well, yeah, Michael, this isn't like they're going to the one and only like <laughs> Oh, I just, Michael's. Uh, I don't think. I think it's a different kind of Mexico. Okay, no. I mean, listen. I I can envision it. We grew up in San Diego, so I I get it. Okay. Oh, we stopped there. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, wait. So literally, dude. And he was the worst. Okay, we had nothing in common. Me and this guy, like. We met at the bar and we were fighting like a married couple within 20 minutes. I hated his taste in music. He, we were like <laughs> bickering the whole drive there. Like there was nothing romantic about this. It and was you guys a, are whacked out on cocaine or? We weren't actually on cocaine, but he was definitely an alcohol. He was a drinker and, and, and I was too. So we were drinking like, yeah, there was alcohol involved. Yes. Okay, okay. And, and actually I met him that night at the bar and we went to Mexico that next morning. So it wasn't actually the same day just to preface mm -hmm. like, yeah. Oh God. Horrible. <laughs> so, so I go to Mexico with this guy the next day and we stop it in San Diego <laughs> and it was, this was another like terrifying experience. Um, we were like bickering the whole way. And we get in this fight and we've just met. It's just ridiculous. So we're at this motel and I was like, you know what? I'm going to go take a walk on the beach. And um, it's nighttime now. And I'm walking down this like random beach in San Diego. And I see there's this like house with a garage right there on the beach. And there's these three guys. They look like frat bro guys. And they're like, hey, like, do you want to? come have a beer with us in our garage. And I'm like, yes, obviously, oh, I, obviously I do. I mean, you just sound fun. <laughs> obviously I do. So I, I go so in. So where's the Mick at this point? What's he doing? He's in the motel. Okay. And he's, he's just like passed out. Like, you know, <laughs> okay. and, and what about and Rudolph? Rudolph is at home in LA okay. in West Hollywood. And he has no clue where you are. No. Okay. Right. No. I just left. Quite the picture to paint. Okay. I just left. I d he does. He did not know where I was, and this was like towards the end of our relationship. I am surprised at how tolerant he was of of my horrific uh, behavior, um, but also too, I was like a kid. Uh, you know, well, twenty two is not a kid, but when we met, I was eighteen. You know, I mean, my brain was not fully developed. Let's put it that way. Um, still isn't, but, um, <laughs> anyway, so the, the guy, so the, the Mick is, is in, at the motel. Are we allowed to say Mick? I, I don't know. Is that offensive? I think it's okay. I'm like 50% Irish. So, so I'm part two. So I feel like, yeah. oh, I thought oh. his name was Mick when you guys oh. kept saying that. I was like, I must've missed Taylor, his name. While we're Google and see if that's offensive. I'm okay. assuming it's, I mean, everything's offensive now, but actually we had gotten in some dumbass fight. I don't even know about what. So I'm walking down the beach. The three frat guys are like, Hey, you want to come in our garage and drink? I'm like, obviously, yes, I can see nothing wrong with this. So I go in, we're all sitting around and they're all kind of staring at me and I'm drinking the beer and and then all of a sudden I have this other moment of clarity, like, what the hell am I doing here? There's these three big frat guys sitting there staring at me like a piece of meat and I'm drinking my beer and I'm just thinking, OK, this is probably very dangerous. And I get that realization. And so I put down my beer after I finish it. And then I say, <laughs> hey, guys, I'm going to head out. I got to go and I get up to walk out of the garage. The one guy, the one frat guy gets up, pushes the garage door to shut the garage. Garage starts shutting down. I see. And it was like, again, the instincts go and it's like, OK, they're going to they're going to hurt me. I know it. So I duck under the garage as it's going down and I run so fucking fast down the beach back to the motel. Then a bottle is thrown a glass bottle from one of the beers is thrown. One of the dudes threw it, tried to hit me, did not hit me. And I just keep running and running and running and get back to the motel. I'm banging on the door to get in. Brian, Brian, let me in, let me in. Nothing. Let me in, let me in. Of course, he has the key. I don't know the key. Banging, banging, banging. Middle of the night. He's not answering. Just will not open the door. So I go to the, it's like one of those like old motels where 
There's no reception area. Do you know what I'm talking about? There's like a sister motel across <laughs> the street that had a reception area. Do you know what I'm talking I'm about? I know what air, you're talking about. Do you know, do you know the area you were in? No. It's, I, it sounds like she was in PB or Mission Valley, if I'm guessing. Probably that. Yeah. Pro- I, like I just Or maybe don't. Oceanside. Yeah. Mm, Dude, I don't. I think Mission Valley. So there was like a sister motel okay. like across the street and they had someone where because there was no one at working at two in the morning on this side of the motel but on the other so I had to go across the street to the other side and ask the receptionist to come and let me in and he let me in and um the dude the Irish dude is just like laying there like sleeping but like there's no way you wouldn't have woken up from me banging on the door I wouldn't have woken up really nope wouldn't have woken for up. For all these years, I'm thinking he no. just was fucking with me. Sometimes I like open an eye and can hear it and then I just go back to sleep. I wouldn't have woken up. Really? No. Okay, so maybe it was innocent. <laughs> maybe it was innocent. Okay. So that was it. And then we drove to Mexico from there. And then... So after all this, we're still like, let's keep going to Mexico. <laughs> well... <laughs> Oh, no, I know. It's insane. Well, what was the, I mean, like, what did you guys think you were going to find down there? Well, because here's the thing. I was done. I was like, you're an asshole. And I, I was so pissed. I think I like pushed him on the bed and I was screaming in his face. Like, why didn't you let me in? He was like, I was sleeping. I was trying to get my sleep. (laughs) (laughs) I need my eight hours. (laughs) Oh my God. So, so we get in this whole fight and then, um, I was like, I want to go home. And he was like, we've got to see Mexico. We've got to go. <laughs> I was like, All right. He somehow convinced me. He somehow convinced me. How was the me. trip? It was terrible. It, it was, was absolutely terrible. It was terrible. Okay, yeah. so what did Rudolph say when you got back and how many days later? So I went to a random payphone in Tijuana and I called him and it was very dramatic. And I remember he picks up, hello, he's German. And I was like... A lot of accents. Lo- I can't not do someone's accent when I'm go, talking about go. them. Like, I love it. Like, I can't not. Go. I. It's impossible. I, you're good at it. Go. <laughs> so he's like, hello. And I'm like, Rudolph, I'm in Tijuana. <laughs> <laughs> and then he's like, come home, Laura. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, I'll never forget that. It was so, so even at the time, I was like, is my life a movie? <laughs> so so one call cut, please. So at what point do you decide that you're going to rehab? Is the uh, when you come back and he, you come home and he mm-hmm. wants you to do yoga and wake Wait, up early? Was this guy just like so <laughs> mature and like he was just like yeah, he was mature. It's just like at this. This is the breaking point for him. Was when I came. He said, "Come home, Laura." So I come home and he's and he says, "You've got to leave." You've got he, had a, he had enough. Yeah. yeah, he had had enough. So how do you find a rehab like that quick? So I never went to rehab, actually. Never went to rehab? No, I only got sober through Alcoholics Anonymous, which is like a free program. You could just That's go amazing. in there all over. That's amazing. Yeah, and I got it, sober. It, yeah. One and done? Like, because sometimes you t- it, it takes people different kinds of times. Yeah, yeah it took it took me a little, a little bit of time. But so from there, so he said, you've got to leave. So I fly back home to Downers Grove, where I'm from. And I go home and I, you know, I'm depressed and, you know, lost this relationship, which I kind of subconsciously wanted, which is why I was so self-destructive in it. And I go out to lunch with my godmother, whose uh, name is a niece. And she's this, she's this whole character, right? She's always in this big mink coat. She always had her fur coats and her cigarettes and too much Botox and hairspray and we we always meet at this Mexican restaurant um, on fucking Ogden Avenue. And we always would meet there. And she's my godmother and she never had kids. So I'm like the daughter she never had. So we, very close. And she's one of the only sober people in my family. In fact, she is the only one besides me that's in recovery. She had been sober from alcohol for maybe 20 years. So she sits there with her big mink coat and her cigarette. And she looks at me and she goes, you look like shit, Laura. Your hair looks like a rat's nest. <laughs> and when she said that, I was like, oh, my God, I need it. I need to get sober. It was like, but she she really, she goes, you look like shit. Your hair looks like a rat's nest. She goes, um, I can tell you have a problem. And if you don't get sober, you know, it's going to be bad. She said, I think you need help. She could just tell from looking at me. It was like, we know. And she could see from from looking at me, um, 
that that I had an alcohol problem. I probably looked emaciated and dark circles and hair looked like a rat's nest. And so she was the one who said, I think you have a problem. And was that relief when someone says that to you and you're so deep in your addiction? Is that relief or is that more stress? Yeah, I think it was relief. Yeah, it was the moment that it stuck for me that that moment and she told me how she got sober and all of a sudden I felt like it was possible to to get clean and it it didn't really seem like it was working for me anymore like I said it was fun then fun with problems and then just problems now we're in the just problems bit you know and so I flew back to LA and I started going to AA meetings and it took me a couple rounds like you said it doesn't always happen right away. And it took me a little bit. At one point I thought I could do like marijuana maintenance because I didn't think weed was my problem. So like, oh, I could smoke a little weed. I just won't drink or do hard drugs. But then inevitably that brought me back to alcohol. So at what point do you meet your husband? So I meet my husband um, when I'm 24 and we, I was 59 days sober. And where, where so are you I had been career sort of, wise at this point when you meet your husband? Career wise, I was making my living off doing commercials okay, okay. and um, the odd sitcom. And I had just booked an independent film with Jason Bateman and Olivia Wilde called The Longest Week. And I played a dumb model named Bunny. And the opening scene in the movie was me in bed with Jason Bateman. No sex, but just la- Did you waking see his up penis? in the morning. I didn't see his dick, no. Okay. Not even a peak. Unfortunately, no. Oh, okay. No, it was just, and he was very nice. And, Seems like a nice guy. Yeah, he was really super nice. But to such a director, like I'm so glad he's directing Ozark. Uh, it's Ozark, right? Yeah, it's incredible. Because, it just ended, but it's incredible. Yeah, because on this movie, there was this like young independent film director who was my friend and he called me. It was in New York and he called me and he was like, Laura, I really want you to do this role, but you got to fly yourself out because it's an indie film and we don't have the budget. So he's like, you got to fly yourself out and put yourself up and you, the role is yours. And I was like, okay, cool. So this was like when I was very newly sober. And so I was broke. I had spent my money on drugs and like I was just barely getting by at this point. And so I asked my sister to borrow money. And then I looked on Facebook and I was like, I've got to find somewhere to stay in New York. So I find this girl I went to high school with who was living in New York. And I was like, hey, Kelly, um, I booked a movie in New York. Can I stay with you? And she was like, "Okay." So I get to fucking Kelly's house, dude. And it's a studio apartment. It's literally the size of this room. And there's one bed. So now Kelly and I, Kelly from high school, who I haven't talked to in years, are sharing a bed. And I'm just like, so you remember Miss Hytene? She's like, yeah. Like it was really oh awkward. God. So I stayed there for like a couple weeks. Kelly and sounds like a nice person. She though. was super nice. Yeah. Super nice to let me stay there. Somebody She's going to hear this podcast and ask you to come stay at your yeah, house Kelly's now. a big listener oh my of ours. God. She's a big listener of ours. Kelly, you're welcome anytime. I, okay, I okay so uh, Steven, yeah. Can you sorry, imagine though somebody calling out. us from high school asking to stay? I don't, no way. No, no fucking way. Right? You know what I mean? Like no that way. was so nice of her. Yeah, no way. I, I feel like you wouldn't even let your mom stay at the house. <laughs> I mean, it's, yeah, even relatives. I'm like, no way. Let alone no. high school. Like, high know, school. Dinosaurs acquaintance. from high school. No yeah. way. You need a place yeah. to stay. Oh, yeah. Taylor needs a place to stay. Yeah, no, no, no okay. chance. Ta- <laughs> no chance. So, so you're 59 days sober. You're working on this movie. You meet Steven on the movie or? Well, the movie happened actually like literally like a couple weeks after Steven and I met. Got but it. you were saying like, where Sorry, were you in your yeah, career? I went on a tangent because obviously. Yeah. Uh, yeah people, so like yeah. I was, but I was, so where I was, I was living with my best friend from three-year-old preschool. His name's Jack. And we've just been best. I mean, we went to three-year-old preschool. We became best friends in junior high, but we were living together. And, um, you know, I was making just enough to like pay my rent, like through, you know, like I said, commercials and sitcoms. And then I was about to book this film um, right after I met Stephen. So Stephen, and, um, I was 59 days sober and I meet Stephen at a party and my sister was the one who invited me. She, my sister is an Anglophile, she, which means she's obsessed with all things British. She only hangs out with British people, only talks about British things. <laughs> she even acquired a British accent to the point where she literally called me and was like, Laura, do you want to get some tea? 
And I'm like, you're from Chicago, but literally was obsessed with all things British. And is your only sister? Oh, uh, two. I have okay. two older sisters. Okay. But the okay. middle sister, I'm the youngest. And okay. then my middle sister's the Anglophile. And then my oldest sister is like a high school math teacher still living in the Chicagoland area. Which one was roofied? The Anglophile. Got it. Yeah. She was like, I feel crazy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, blimey. Um, anyway, so she calls me and she's like, Laura, you're being so antisocial. You need to get out of your apartment and come to this party. Or sorry, she was like, come to this party right now. But um, and because I was being sort of antisocial, I was newly sober. Like I just didn't really want to risk being around alcohol at the time. Now I have over 10 years sober. I could be around it. It's all good. But at the time, it was a little difficult for me. So I was being very antisocial. So I was also dating this guy who was an entertainment lawyer named Ben. And we weren't exclusive, but we were dating. Like we hadn't had the talk, but we were dating. So I call Ben and I say, hey, my sister invited me to this party. Um, it was at um, the producer of Radiohead, um, who was my sister's ex-boyfriend. It was his house. And it was like all these Brits, whatever. So... <laughs> um, Sorry, where was I? Lost my train of thought. So I call Ben, who's the the entertainment lawyer who I'm dating. And I say, hey, you know, my sister invited me to this party. Do you want to go with me? And he was like, yeah, OK. So then he calls me at like 6 p.m. And he goes, hey, work is running late. I can't make the party tonight. And I thought, oh, my God, this is great. What, an, what a great excuse not to go to this party. Ben canceled, so I'm not going to go. So I call my sister. I say, hey, Ben canceled, so I can't come to the party. And she's like, Laura, you're a grown woman. Like, you don't need a man to take you to a party. Like, get your ass here now. And I was like, oh, fine. So I begrudgingly went to this party. I walk in. There's like this whole garden area where everyone's hanging out. And I, I walk in and these, my sister and her friends always had weird theme parties. It was never just like a party. Like there was always a weird theme attached to it. So this theme was dress like your parents did um, the year that they gave birth to you. What? What? That's too complicated. Isn't it? That's too complicated. That's, That's too complex. What the fuck? Ooh, that hurts my brain. Doesn't it? Yeah. So I'm thinking 1986. Hmm. Okay. Let's think about this. So um, f my first thought was I'm going to dress in a hospital gown with my ass cheeks out because <laughs> that is what my mother wore when she gave birth to me. And I really thought about that. And I thought, that's good. That's commitment. I want to do that. I like it. You, didn't you? Yeah. Full ass cheeks out, yeah. hospital gown. I love it. I was committed. And then I Perfect. thought, mm, I just, I changed my, I'm sober now. I've got to be, take myself a little more seriously. Okay. So I, so I find this like little pink and black dress, like mini dress from Fred Siegel. It's like this little tight, little cute dress. And I do my hair all big and curly. It was looking cute. And so I walk in and I see this man and he's standing across the garden area and he's wearing this beautiful suit. And he had this really nice smile. And I remember looking across the room and just spotting him and seeing this man with this beautiful smile. He was laughing with his friends. And I just remember distinctively thinking that man has a beautiful smile and I want to talk to him. And so I make my way over and I notice that he's holding a bottle of water. And I was like, okay, Laura, he's holding water. Think, think, think. And I just went up to him and I was like, hey, um, Where'd you get your water? <laughs> <laughs> and then, That's good. I like that. Really? Yeah, I like it. Okay, thank it's you. It's so simple, but you know, it's like unique. You know I mean? Yeah. <laughs> and I literally did want some water. So it wasn't even like it was just a line. It's like perfect. I genuinely was thirsty. So I, I, he then looks at me and he's like, Paulson? Like he's sort of like taken aback. And then I just keep talking because I'm nervous. So I'm like, yeah, no, I just, I love, I just love water. Like, it's really important to stay hydrated. <laughs> and that is the first thing I ever said to him. Where'd you get your water? I just, I love water. It's important to stay hydrated. That is the quote. Like, I'll never forget the first words I said to him. And it's so interesting. He's a yeah. producer. Steven. Yes. Yeah. Which is so crazy because yeah. I feel like it complements everything you do. Yes. 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 So he's, he came, he flew out to, um, right. Actually, he's a composer as well as a music producer. So he, 
came out to work with Hans Zimmer, who's like the biggest oh, geez, um, yeah. film composer yeah. in the world. And Hans Zimmer heard his music because he was writing uh, film scores on in indie films in London. And Hans heard his music and was like, come out to Los Angeles and work for me. And Stephen's like, okay. Did Hans do the Pirates of the Caribbean? Um, that's a good... Taylor, did he Google that? Or I know, I mean, I obviously yeah. know who he is, but he's done like everything. But like Stephen worked, he's done everything. Yeah. Stephen did Transformers, Madagascar, Mission oh, cool. Impossible. Um, yeah, what he yeah. did. See, uh, I knew Hans Zimmer did that. I yeah, knew. there you yeah. go. There you go. So Stephen worked on all these big Hollywood movies with, with Hans. But um, and that's why he moved to L.A. So you're both very talented. It's interesting wow. that you found each other at a party, both with water, very talented. Well, yes. And so I so he goes, I said, it's really important to stay hydrated. And then he looks at me and he goes, obviously, you don't love water or you would have brought some yourself. And I was like, are you accusing me of not liking water? Because I do like water. I just didn't bring any, but I do actually love water. And he was like, I'm just saying, if you really loved it, you would have brought some. So the chaos is already yeah. starting before yeah. like even like the first step. Yes. Love it. Yeah. So I was like, whatever, I'm going to go find some water. And I like leave. And then I mingle for like 30 minutes. And then I'm, I'm, everyone's getting progressively drunker and higher. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to go. So I was like, I guess I'll say goodbye to the water guy. So I go back to Steven and I was like, hey, like I'm leaving. And he was like, why are you leaving? And I said, cause I'm the only sober person here. And he goes, well, I'm sober. And it was this moment of like, oh, you're sober too. Like that makes sense. You've got the water. And then I was like, sober, sober. Cause there's two different types of sober. Sure. There's like, I'm driving tonight sober. Or like I'm a raging alcoholic and that's why I'm sober. And he was like, sober, sober. And it was very clear that he was sober, like I was sober. So all of a sudden we had this instant connection and we start talking and he's been sober for almost 10 years at that point. And he was like, I'm new to LA. Like, I are, do you know of any good AA meetings? And I was like, yes, I have one tomorrow that I go to at the log cabin in West Hollywood. And he was like, great, I'll meet you there. We met at the AA meeting and then we had like a three hour lunch after and we just laughed the whole time. And truly the rest is history. And I think about that a lot. And I think about that day and I think about if Ben had not canceled on me, if Ben, the guy that I was dating, had come with me to that party, I would have never met Stephen. I certainly would have asked, wouldn't have asked him where he got his water and flirted with him because that would have been rude. I mean, I don't know. You went to Mexico with the other guy. So now <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. You're right. But I do think about that, and I think, how would my life be different? Like, don't you ever think about those little moments all the time that change your whole life? Yeah. Yeah. There's something in your book that you did that I pinned to my Pinterest board. And you talk about how you were dating your husband at the time. It's like, I think you said three months in, correct me if I'm wrong. And he, you hacked into his Facebook and he was doing something shady. And you decided that you, (laughs) this is so good. I literally like highlighted, I swear to God, on my Kindle uh, for inspo. You yeah. projected onto a huge yes. big screen TV yes. the um, DMs yes. in Facebook that were inappropriate. So yes. when he walked in, everything was dark. Yes. Besides on a huge big screen oh, TV, <laughs> the inappropriate DMs. I love that. I, I mean, I really love that. I was like, wow, yeah. this is like some cinema. You get yes. some drama. That's right. You um, hit it from all angles. He did, right. What's he going to say when you walk? And where in? were you when That's he right. saw these? Like, in the dark, doing? sitting on the couch. Oh, yeah. I was sitting right there waiting Quiet. for his ass to get home. Nice and dark. Yeah. Oh, Jesus and play Christ. the Gone Girl music. Oh, yeah. yeah. It Sugar was a, Storm. That's right. Yes. 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 Exactly. Yeah. When he walked in, yeah. you're in the dark. Oh, yeah. And that's projected onto the that's screen. That's right. What did he do? He was like, oh, wait. <laughs> Dude, no. He was like, his eyes got <laughs> even bigger than they already are. Oh, my God. <laughs> and then the most pathetic response, which, you know, people have those, right? When they're caught. I've had them. We've all had them. Most people have had him. Who did that? <laughs> that is disgusting. That is really sick. I think someone hacked into my computer. Who did you say you're I was done? Like, oh, come on. He was like, it was a hacker. I don't, I would have, that is really sick. That what is. Was he, doing? Just, he was like DMing. He said it was a hacker that hacked into his. But was he just like going back and forth with somebody? Yeah, it was like flirtatious. Like there was this German girl. I don't know what's Rudolph's up with that. Rudolph's sister. Yeah. <laughs> And they were just like having flirtatious conversations. This is early in the relationship. Early. Like we had been dating for like maybe a month or something. We were new. 
And so yeah. you open up about that. You yeah. didn't open up about that in your in your first book. And yeah. then you also open up. And yeah. I was like, this was such a moment that I yeah. think for women to read, so yeah. important, cheating. Yeah, yeah. Why did you decide to open up about that? Well, because... I needed stories for my second book. You know? <laughs> I, You're like, go cheat on me so I can get some content, bitch. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I, I because I, I made a pact to myself to be rigorously honest in, in the second book. And I was in my first book, but there were still, I really dug deep and went, what were the stories I withheld from my first book? Because I was scared of ju- to be judged. And I was just scared of criticism and what people would think of me or of us. And so there were certain things. And that's why I have a whole chapter called the story. Me too, though, the stories I was too scared to tell, which I go into all of those stories that for one reason or another, I was too scared to tell in my first book. Um, I also think that I was just so sick of seeing like hashtag relationship goals under like all of our posts. And it's like, no, dude, like we're just as flawed as every other couple. Like we you don't. You mean people, your people that right? were in your community following you, writing that about your relationship. Yes. Okay, okay, okay. Yes, sorry. sorry, yes. So like we would, I every time he's in a video with me or whatever, it's always hashtag relationship goals. Oh my God, the perfect couple or whatever. Like I, we would just get comments like that. And we are a wonderful match. We really are. But like we're flawed too. And I wanted to write about that. And of course I asked him and I said, hey, I want to write about the time that you cheated on me. And um, during your relapse is, you know, are you okay with that? Because it is his story too. And if he wasn't okay with it, I would have honored that, you know, because it's his story too. How did you not want to kill the person that was like involved with him? Because it sounds oh, like you were pretty pragmatic about it. Like in no, the I, book, you were like, you were like, it's his fault. You like realized. Yeah. I, I, but of course I wanted to, to kill her. That's why I drove to where they were going to meet and looked for her. Cause I wanted to murder her in the dark to, uh, to a projector sugar storm. Yes, yeah. exactly. I bet you had something creative. There was a moment where I did. And then when I thought about it and I'm looking around for this, this woman that I don't know what she looks like, you'll have to get my book to for more details. Yeah, on you this. guys, this but is this way in depth in story. Intense. Yeah. It's intense. Yeah. Um, but then I just had this again, this this moment of clarity where um I was like, it's not her. I should be after it's it's him. Like Was it easy to I'm not repair to her. that I'm after him? Like he cheated? <sighs> um Or was it a lot of work? You know, I think because I've been unfaithful, clearly, right, in Mexico, and that I, I could empathize with it. Yeah. Like, I, especially being in your addiction, like, he at the time was, um, he had relapsed. He was on drugs during that time. So he was not himself. It was not good. There was, we were married at this point for four or five years. Children at this time or no? No, no, okay, no children, so, okay. no children. And we were all good. And then he got in a little fender bender and was like, my back hurts. <laughs> Went to the doctor. There were doctors like, here's some drugs. And then, oh, I have trouble sleeping. Here's some drugs. And then I have anxiety. Here's some drugs. And they just, he kept like doctor shopping. And he was addicted to so many different uh, prescription drugs that like he was not acting himself. He was also in denial. Every time I try to question him about his drug use, he'd say, they're all doctor prescribed. I'm still sober. To the point where he was still taking cakes in AA meetings, like for his sober birthday, because in his mind, he's sober because they're all doctor prescribed, but he's abusing these drugs. And eventually he realized that. And he comes home one day and he's like, I have to stop. I have to stop. He throws all his pills down the toilet. And um, then he starts like shaking and seeing things. And so I'm freaking out. So I call someone in the program and I'm like, hey, like, even seeing things that aren't there. He just threw out all his pills and they were like, get him to the hospital now. And I was like, okay. So I take him to the hospital and within 20 minutes of being in the hospital, he's in a full seizure, full on seizure. This is a massive withdrawal. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Massive withdrawal. Yeah. You can, if you stop cold turkey taking like Xanax, which they'll say is like the least addictive anti-anxiety, which is a lie. Yep. And they don't care. Um, but Xanax, I think Oxy can do it too, but 
if you just stop cold turkey after abusing it, you can go into a full seizure and die. I mean, it happens. And it almost did to him. I thought he died in front of me. That's important to say. Yeah. I think for anyone who's listening, that's the, you said that in your book too. Like yeah. that's such a good uh, tip. I mean, you can't just cut it cold yes. turkey. Yes, yes. If you're, if you're wanting, considering getting clean, I recommend medically detoxing. Mm. I didn't medically detox personally, but I wasn't taking prescription drugs. I was binge drinking, so... I wasn't, but but I think to be safe, medically detox. Yeah. You you don't have to tell us the full story because mm. there's there's so many stories mm. in your book. But mm. one that stood out that I was like, I was dying and I like love that you shared was the massage parlor. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hold on. So you, you go to, you book a massage yeah. thinking like you're going in yeah. for like a Thai massage. Yeah. The reason, by the way, this is so interesting to me yeah. is because I have this addiction to foot spots. Well, she told oh, me that Lauren yes. told me this story. Uh, really bad addiction. And she told me this story yeah. and then I started thinking like you go to these things like every oh, week all the time. I honestly don't care if they finger bang me while they're rubbing my feet because I'm so comfortable. It's just like have uh, they tried? Uh, no. I mean, yeah. You know. <laughs> I just, no, they haven't tried. I just get my feet done, and for two hours I sit there. I know those and places. Let me tell about, you, it's, amazing. it's uninterrupted work away Ugh. from the baby, away from Michael. Everything. I can sit there and yeah. just work and have my feet rubbed. Ugh. But I so, hope that's all that's getting rubbed. What the hell is going on over there now? Now, now I'm gonna start <laughs> thinking. You're... You can come with me. I'm gonna go check this place out. Okay, <sighs> you have come with me before. <laughs> okay, so so you go to just like a massage yeah. place. I'm thinking it's hole in the wall. Is that right? Yeah, pretty much. Yeah. And you book a massage. Yeah. And you go in and you think you're getting a massage. Yeah, and I did. I did go. <laughs> so when she starts like going deeper, lower. Here's the thing. She didn't finger bang me. She literally made me orgasm from over the sheets. I've never experienced anything like it. Okay. Does she know it what was, she's doing? It was of course, wild. Of course she knows what she's doing. Clearly. Clearly. What are you talking about? Okay. Well, at first I didn't know because I was like, She's just massaging like really close to the area. And so I was like, whoa, I'm getting really turned on right now. But I don't know, like, am I horny or is she like purposely touching me in this area? Because sometimes you can't help it, right? You're being rubbed in certain areas and like maybe you feel a little some type of way, but it's innocent. Taylor's like, what is the massage parlor right <laughs> on? What street is it on? <laughs> Oh my, oh my god. god. I'm getting aroused right now. <laughs> oh my go god. ahead. Go ahead. Because you have to tell the best part of yeah. the story. Go ahead. Well, no, it was just that. And like, so she's, you know, like rubbing me in that area. But again, like I said, it was over the sheets. Like she wasn't actually touching my vagina. Like she was over the sheets. But she was like rubbing like this, like, like that, like that, like my vagina. So like she knew that. what she was doing. But like, it was like she was rubbing me and then it was like, oh, my God, whatever you're doing, like, this is wild. And she was like, does that feel good? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, 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 it does. She was like, OK. <laughs> but like, you know, it was just she asked me, does that feel good? And I think that was her way of saying, should I keep going? Because if I was like, no, then she would have stopped. But I was like, yes which gave her the go ahead to keep going. So you and have an orgasm. And the, yeah. And then yeah. then th this is the best part of the whole story. Yeah. What what happened? Well, I had to go back and just see what <laughs> that was about. Was it a, was, was it, it a loud orgasm a or a silent? Um it was I was pretty like chill about it. So I, she probably didn't know that you had just climbed. I think she did. I think she knew, but I was very subtle with it. Like I was like, uh, like that, like, mm -hmm, like, but not like, oh God, like I wasn't like that. <laughs> That's what I was You know, like for. I wasn't like that because I also didn't want the other people to hear me, like the other people getting innocent massages. You know what I mean? They're just trying to get their fucking foot rubbed. And like, oh, yeah. You know, no, I didn't. Want I was that. probably next door. Yeah, exactly. Work, working on email. I didn't want you to hear me specifically. <laughs> OK, so you yeah, go back. So it was like very, very subtle. And, orgasm. and when you but go back knew. to she knew that you're like back for more. She, yeah. She yeah. was like, you're back for more. Back for more. Didn't even have to say anything. anything. It was like implied. So I, yeah, it's interesting because you always hear about like happy ending places, but like you never experience. No, no one's ever talked no about it. <laughs> well, we I love that you're pissed. You're like, no one has ever <laughs> offered me 
I'm, yeah, I'm kind of. I was thinking that actually. I'm like, why haven't I ever been? Well, Lauren, you're on there with your fucking emails. They're probably like this person. You're you know, not giving off the like. I want to. Also, I'm 600 vibes. months pregnant. Like no, uh, like no, not her but today. Like, literally <laughs> pregnant. Do you get horny pregnant? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there you go. Like, you know what, you know? Michael? If you're tired, <laughs> you know what, Lauren? You're putting off the vibe because you're in there with your emails and your contraptions, and you're not right. Good to know. I need to put off a different vibe. You need to put off. Different so vibe. when you tell your yeah. husband, hey, like, listen, like, yeah. you know, yeah. what does he say? Is he mad or is he turned on? So like, literally, I did not tell him <laughs> until I was writing this book. <laughs> oh, I, I literally, I just never said anything. Uh, so and my point of writing that was like, OK, I'm not perfect either. And that's that's cheating. That's that's cheating. That is cheating. I also cheated. Did he think it was cheating? He got just like super turned on. He I know. just like got frisky. Like he was God, like, tell wor- me more. We're, we're like, the worst. We're the n- worst. You, yeah. <laughs> like not for even a second was he upset about that. <laughs> not for one. Taylor, would no. you be mad? I, no, not at all. Oh. I'd be like, awesome. Taylor. I Taylor know the details too. I, 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 Taylor, I, I, I don't understand. Don't, I don't know if I want you behind me the rest of this interview. <laughs> <laughs> my pants are getting tighter every second. Oh, oh my God, Taylor. God. Literally. Okay. So but yeah, th- these are just some of the stories that you guys can read in this book. I mean, it's really, really captivating. I feel like Michael and Taylor want to go pick up the book and read it. So yeah. I need to get... Also, the audiobook is really fun, too. Because you read it. Yeah, it's just more... It takes you there. I'm sure there's a lot of accents. Yeah, there's a lot of accents. It just takes you there in a way. My audiobooks always way outsell my book books. Just really? Because, that's interesting. Yes. And and they do with most like female comedians, actually, because you want to hear it. True. It's just... It's like a movie. So what Taylor's doing right now is he's on Audible buying it, and he's going to skip <laughs> to the part where you talk about your massage so mm-hmm. he can re-listen mm-hmm. to it while, while he uh, does his oh, business my. later. God. Okay. I should recreate that. Yeah. I in a like a non pornographic way. I'm like recreating stories from my book. You should recreate that one. I don't know how I could recreate it in like a non porny way. You should do it as if you're in like a setting of like an old English library. Like, hello, chaps. Taylor's like customizing it to like (laughs) his. Taylor, you're a fucking creep, man. Taylor's like, wear this color. (laughs) So I want to get to the part Mm. of where you give birth live. Natural the first time, right? Second. Second. First of all, how bad is natural birth? Are you considering? I don't know. After reading your chapter, I was like, <laughs> should I? I couldn't I couldn't decide what way you were trying to sway me. Well, yeah. If that's... you had to do it again, what are you doing? I would go natural. Really? Yes. What were the sounds coming out do of you? Do you want to know natural? why? Because um, I have a theory that you're going to feel pain with childbirth regardless, whether it's after or during. If you get the epidural, the pain's going to be after. You feel I like you're hit by a I didn't feel that much pain. You didn't? Uh-uh. I just felt like there was a bowling ball coming out. Like, it's pressure. Did, did you have an have epidural? That, yeah, I didn't have, like... No, but pain. I post, liked birth. Pain postpartum. Though. It wasn't oh, that bad. No, but Lauren, you oh. no, you're forgetting. Lauren, I you, may be forgetting though. I might be forgetting. No, Lauren had. Yeah. I mean, she talked about. We've talked yeah. about this. She's had terrible postpartum. You forget anxiety and depression. But I'm not talking about what your physical you're, pain. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You didn't have like. Te- did you tear? Uh uh-uh. uh You didn't tear. No. Okay. I don't think. Like yeah. I mean, maybe. So then so I then had like you, one stitch or something. So then. You know, if you had a good birth with an epidural, do that. So do that. Doing it again, though, you do natural. <laughs> yeah, because I didn't like the epidural because I couldn't feel anything. I was n- completely numb to the point where when it was time to push, I didn't know because I couldn't feel anything because I was completely numb. And huh. yeah, they put too much in me, I think. Or or like and then I, I had like- more time in between. So it was worn off. Maybe we like you had less time. Does that make sense? Maybe. Maybe, but you didn't feel like you were hit by a truck after, after the epidural wore off. You weren't, because I was in so much pain after. I don't remember it. And you I, know what, Lauren, yeah. you forget, you got, you're allergic to whatever that spray is. Oh, that, that was the worst part. fucked you that up That was the worst that. part. That tape. Like no, but gnarly. that was, that was the worst part though. That's what I'm saying. That no, but wasn't, I think, that's uh, not no, what she's talking uh, about. No, uh, she's forgetting. She was, you were uncomfortable. Okay. But like in your head, it's funny how nature makes us forget. Yeah, so I don't we'll remember have more babies. Yeah. Like, you're Probably because like, it it's, like, it's a trauma, really right? manipulative, real manipulative. Seriously. It reminds me of like an ex. Like, but it so sounds like you had a good birth. I had a great birth. Easy. So why would you even change it just to experience it? I guess you could always see how far you can get without if you're interested in what that feels like. And then if it's too much, I don't know just, if I'm interested. Then there you go. <laughs> then there you go. Okay, so you decide yeah. to have to do. 
yeah. I, first of all, when you give birth on Facebook Live, do we get to see the crowning in the vagina or you can't show that? I didn't give birth on Facebook Live. I gave birth on fi- like I filmed we filmed the birth and then I posted it after. But can you see everything? Um, I blurred a little vagina out, um, but you could see like blood. You could see stuff. Yeah. So it's not like it's from behind and you're vlogging on YouTube. You could see. Yeah. You could literally see with Alfie. You could literally see Alfie coming out. What inspired you to give birth on Facebook and what inspired like, was that like gnarly? I mean, I would just feel like that's so much energy in the room. Yeah, I just love birth stories. I could watch them all day. If you've posted your birth vlog online, I've watched it six times with snacks. Like I love watching women give birth. It's really weird. I love it. I've watched every type, natural, epidural, C-section, free birthing, all of it, man. I fucking love it. But I also grew up making horror films when I was a kid, so nothing grosses me out. I just think birth is so miraculous. And I became like addicted to watching birth stories. I I loved them. And I also wanted to prepare for my own birth. So I wanted to see how they would go. So I was educating myself on the on what it would look like. That makes and sense. Making Steven watch them with me. Oh. He was like, God damn it. Have any more birth vlogs? He's like, you're projecting yeah. it on the screen in the dark. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> watch this. But um, yeah, so that's um, that's why I thought you know what? We'll film some of it. And by the way, we filmed 15 minutes of like a 16 hour birth. So it wasn't like there was a camera the whole time. It was literally him with an iPhone filming here and there. Like it was still very intimate. And then I thought I filmed my first contraction and then we filmed a little bit later on. And then we filmed when it was happening, but it was, I didn't even realize there was an iPhone camera happening anyway. And I went back and forth on whether or not to post it. I just thought I like to make content that I want to watch and I like watching birth stories. It's educational. It's miraculous. So why not? I couldn't see any sort of, I don't know. I just thought it would be interesting and compelling. Incredible. Yeah. I mean, yeah. And then not only that, then you also opened up online about your postpartum, which Mm -hmm. is another thing no one talks about ever. Mm -hmm. I had really bad postpartum depression, anxiety. It sounds like you did too. Yeah, I did with Poppy. It was really but not weird. with Alfie. No, with Alfie, I had a bad physical, like the physical recovery was was difficult. With Poppy, I, which was the natural birth, Alfie was epidural. Um, I had like easy. I was just right back. Felt great right after. Like, just such a difference with Poppy. But then mentally, um, I struggled with Poppy. Yeah, definitely had some postpartum depression. Uh, did you have tools that you used to to help? like lift it? Um, yes, I, I did. And for me, and I think a lot of people, antidepressants works great for me. I just didn't want to take them and I'm not against them, but I wanted to try and get better naturally first or with unmedicated, I should say. And then if that wasn't working, absolutely. I would have taken the antidepressants. No problem if it was uh, becoming debilitating. But so what I did and this is just me, not a doctor. I know y'all thought I was a doctor, not a doctor. Um, I decided, okay, I got like really sick and tired of feeling sick and tired. I was just, the negative voice in my head was so bad. Steven and I were fighting, like as you do with a newborn, you know, a newborn. So hard. Oh my God. It was like newborn, toddler, just, I felt my mom was in town. There was just tension and it was just bad. Your mom's trying to give you social media advice. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. It was a lot. It was a lot. Steven and I got in some of the worst fights we've ever been in. It was just not, there were beautiful moments with Poppy, beautiful moments. Someone described motherhood, especially new motherhood as brutal, brutal and beautiful. And I thought that was pretty spot on. Brutal. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Now it's like easier, right? They sleep through the night. It's like, we've got a system figured out it's easier than it was. What's it. how? What time do they go to bed? That's one thing we're working on. So are we? Yeah. Really? Oh, Wait, sorry. how old is your little one? She's two. We're two, working on two. And two and a half. What? Two and a half. Yeah. Two and and a half. when does she go to bed? Oh God. 
late. I mean, like, same yeah. with Alfie. Oh, same with Alfie. We went to bed last night at nine thirty. Same or 10. with Alfie. Same with Alfie. Yes, Which, and we're uh, just trying to make it earlier now. Everyone, when I tell them that, is like so judgy about it. That's the time she goes to bed because I would rather her sleep in. Thank you. So I can get some sleep. Thank you. Like, sorry, I'm just being honest. Literally. And if she likes going to bed at that time. I'm going to be honest too. Lauren and I are very like chaotic individuals. And so like, everyone's like the yeah. schedule, the schedule, the schedule. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, like we don't, it's, it's I'm, not a, I'm hanging on by know? the handlebars. Like, like sometimes we're here, sometimes we're in Texas, sometimes we're this place. I'm white knuckling through this. The kids gotta kind of keep up. You yeah, know? totally. I yes. mean, listen, and yes. we've we've had definitely have had help, but yeah. still, it's just she goes to bed late. Yeah. She does what she wants, I guess. Yeah, I love that, and she sleeps through the night. She sleeps through the night sometimes so until, and sometimes she wakes up and screams rice as loud as she can. <laughs> rice right. or She's, juice? Oh, cute. No, it's not cute. <laughs> That's I'm dead cute. asleep, dead asleep. <laughs> Just <laughs> It's not, it's not, it's, it's a it's lot. It's cute as a story, but in practice, when you're on the receiving end in the middle of the night, it's. Oh, in the middle of the night. In the middle of the it. night. Like oh, she'll rip good. you out of bed. She'll come out of nowhere. Like she'll crawl out of wherever she was. Wait, really? And then she, you're just done. So, she, so she's not in a crib anymore. No, we're getting her out of the, we get her out of the crib. We're Alfie's right. literally still in a crib, but he, they say keep him in a crib. Alfie just turned three. We don't know. Don't ask us. We're not like the <laughs> experts on a, ba- a baby. <laughs> He's never tried to get out. So I'm like, you're staying in until you figure oh, out you can get the hell out. Can I Jump tell you? the shark on the crib, <laughs> Can man. I tell you what happened? We have the new one coming and the new one, the room that the first one was in is a better room for the new one because it's got, it's just easier access from our bedroom and it's just a better room to put a newborn in. Okay. So then I, my dumb ass was like, okay, well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to kick her out of her room yeah. that she likes. And make her have a but new room. I make room. a new oh. room. Like, and the so way you I was bought a it, new room. The way I made it exciting, I was like, I found a new big girl bed. And it was a huge mistake, let me tell you. Because now she, she can get out. She can get the fuck out. Now I'm trying to figure out a locked door solution. But we then have kinda, a friend that locks then you feel bad. someone in. Or locks her daughter in. You know, just locks the daughter in and just uh, sh- like... That's, yeah. that's it. Steven and I were like, is that abusive? Like, but then I, I think don't the same know. thing as a crib, right? That's what, yes, exactly. <laughs> we're like, wait, is it a fire hazard? Because like, I'm terrified when we transition Alfie that he's going to get up, walk outside and go go out, like to go play. Because like, you don't know. Turn what on you're the stove. Sleeping? Yeah, that's true. Yes, oh, that is st- true. Literally, like he can unlock the front door. Like, what if he just decides to bounce? See, I don't. Oh, mind. I never thought about that. Well, Think she, about it. She won't be able to get the, like do that because there's other. But like, I I don't mind if she goes to bed in her room and then gets up in the night and comes into the bed after we've already slept and got yeah. organized. But like trying to, like, I don't want her to go to sleep with us. You know, right? Exactly. Because it becomes a habit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's so hard. Yeah. It's so hard. If anyone has any tips, let us know. No, totally. Well, it's funny because I thought Alfie was the only toddler that like went to bed at literally sometimes 930. And we just the past two nights, just the past two nights thought we've got to get his bedtime up just a little. Like, it's so funny you said that because both our kids, Poppy and Alfie, and I just want to say this for any like new expecting parents, don't believe people when they say you're never going to sleep again. I refused to believe that reality. I refused when they would say, oh, you'll never sleep again. And I was like, "Mm, nope, that's not my reality. My kids will be amazing sleepers. My kids will be amazing sleepers. You know, Steven and I are like obsessed with manifestation. Louise hate it. You Louise Louise hate visualization. Every morning and every night religiously, we'd say, we're so happy and grateful. Our kids are incredible sleepers. They sleep through the night. They're healthy. They're happy. They sleep. No joke. These kids sleep till... They slept till 9.30 in the morning this oh, morning. Oh, fuck you. I swear to God. We got to manifest a little oh more. Oh my God, I got to turn on Louise. Hey, dude, manifest she, that shit, She man. sleeps till 7, 7.30, I, 9.30. I fucking, dude. Do I, they take a nap? Yeah. Alfie sleeps for three hours during the day and Poppy takes two Two hour, I'm gonna two have to this, three hour I'm naps. gonna have this girl go run laps. Do you have roofies in your I'm not, No, I swear <laughs> to God. What's going on? They there? eat a lot of food. They they walk, they take a lot of walks. They like just, I'm telling you, I, and maybe this sounds like so delusional, but I feel like we visualized it. Okay, I'm gonna I visualize that. I feel like we, we didn't accept when people were like, you're not gonna sleep. I just refused to accept that reality. And then we just, it just, happened this is pumping me up but i do i'm into into this right yeah but i do think a little bit and we're steven and i are are like you guys like we're a little like 
out there, eccentric, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we're not- What gave you that impression We're not us? normal, <laughs> like, you know? So yep. we're not the most structured individuals, but when we did implement a routine, and we weren't like crazy with it, but just like, this is the time that they nap and like, that really did help with their sleep schedule is having more set nap times. Just, and we did it out of our sanity because we just what wanted- What time is the nap? So, well, for which one? For both. Okay, so like Poppy is one years old and one year old. And so she wakes up, I'm not kidding you, like nine. <laughs> okay. And she goes to bed at like- No, it was easier when they were younger. It's hard. At the what two time? And a half Hold on, what time does she go to bed? She goes to bed between seven and eight. Okay. So she, she, and she, she just literally plop her down. I try and rock her and she's like, get me into the crib. Like, I just want to sleep. And she grabs her pacifier and she's just like, just, she's easy. She sounds easy. Yes. And you're going to have that same have easy, thing. Same easy, thing with this baby. Do you know easy, boy, girl, easy. you're saying? We know we haven't surprise? said, we haven't told okay. anyone. Okay. What do you think? I Guess. think. Manifest. Boy. Yeah. Uh, we'll I'm see. not a, I'm not a psychic, okay. but. I like to visualize, but what I want in life, okay. but I think you're having a boy. Okay. I'll yeah. message you the okay. second that I, Please. that I tell people Okay, before you go for yeah. my own selfish reasons, you have to tell me mm -hmm. about why people are so judgmental about breastfeeding because in your book, you talk yeah. about this. I don't understand why anyone cares. I know how anyone feeds their baby as long as the baby's getting fed. It's yeah. unbelievable yeah. to me that people that you don't know on the internet yeah. are chastising you in on your Instagram yes. for breastfeeding. Can you talk about for that? For breast or for not? For breastfeeding. For breastfeeding. Like in public, basically. Oh, they, okay, okay. So people are just offended. I think it's just this prudish. I think it's honestly an American thing too, especially here. It's just the kind of this culture of, oh, co cover up like your attention seeking because you're I'm breastfeeding publicly. Like I'll post pictures of it because I think it's beautiful. Why does anyone care? Like I don't. And it's women who get really upset, what which do is they crazy say? to me. You're never going to see. Yeah. But guys aren't coming to me like, man, I'm pissed off about but, this. Like, but, but also some guys are. Because it's you're using breasts not for them, and they ah, get pissed about that. So some I'm some not gonna guys even try to unpack. Yeah, that. some guys do get pissed because the breasts are being used for something else other than for the, their enjoyment. So you get a lot of misogynistic comments from men and from women. And she she gets like five to ten thousand comments on her pictures. And no, no, her I've I've perused. Right, especially before this interview, I was like, Damn. oh, you've perused her breastfeeding <laughs> photos. <laughs> that That's sounded, creepy. That sounded strange. I mean, I have perused yeah. the account, yeah. your account. Yeah, she, right? you get a lot of comments. You get a lot of. I engagement. specifically so went to. He that. perused. Yeah. He God. looked at yeah. your breastfeeding uh, photos uh, before. That's yeah. fine. Okay. Well, you know, listen, Taylor's on your Instagram right now. I I'm call me. Right now. What, Call me what you Free want, Free the Lauren. nip, man, honestly. Lauren, I'm a thorough Free investigator. Free the nip. Free that shit. Did I you agree. breastfeed? I breastfed for a little bit. Yeah. I I liked and it, but I didn't put pressure on myself. That's amazing. But I also didn't look at what anyone else was doing. I literally yeah. listened to my intuition of what I wanted to do. And what I wanted to do was do it for a couple months. And then when I felt like I was done with it, I was done with it. I didn't ask any... I like didn't even want to see the lactation person. Totally. Like all of that. I just did it in the way that felt natural to me. Yeah, I and love that. That's what every, like, Cause that, yeah, cause I, you know best. You know best. It's wild though. Alfie was two and a half, well, I, literally, and it was crazy weaning him. He just- Two and a half years is a long I know. time. You're a, a hero. That's well, a and I had one heroic. on each tit. So I had Poppy on one tit, Alfie on the other. How much work is that? You know, it was, it. I'm weird though, because I like, that, Be, you said the could, oxy, yes, the oxy, what's yes, it called? Uh, uh, oxy, uh, oxytocin. oxytocin yeah. Yes, oxytocin, serotonin, all those feel good hormones come. And it's, I'm going to so, lean into that this birth and see if I get that. I'm going to DM you and tell you. I didn't, no, I don't remember feeling that. Yeah. I, I didn't mind it. I just don't remember feeling the oxy hit. Oh, I definitely got that. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> po but Poppy at 10 months was like, no, done. I, I want, Three course adult size meals. By the way, she ten months so though is still a really long time to breastfeed. That's I know. so it gnarly. Is. It is, especially after you've yeah. given your body up for yeah. 
a long time. It's, yeah. it's like, I th- I honestly think it's like hero shit. And then it's wild the way your tits just disappear. Like literally I had, I'm probably at a B now, maybe even an A. I was double D. Like I had titties for days. <laughs> from from breastfeeding. Like, yes, girl. Yes. The milk, they're just Woo! And then the second you stop, it's like Meow. mine didn't but I'm do that excited either. About this I, I could just, uh, but I have fake boobs. So, okay, so I don't they, know. They didn't. So, I feel like they didn't. But they didn't fluctuate. Lauren, are you kidding I bet me? They did. Those, things are, those things are lethal weapons. Remember. Massive, right? Well, right They're now they now, are. Right? No, well, no. But, I'm like an old sow. No, no, no. Right no. now. <laughs> No, but the, on my like. Okay, listen. The, they're huge. They're, they're like, are oh, they huge? They're not. They're bigger. huge, yeah. but but listen, I don't they're know. huge to begin with, and then right. you fill them up with breast milk. Well, and they're it's, fake. Yeah, but they're out of control. I mean, yesterday I was naked in front of him, and he looked at me. Uh, he looked at me like he was scared. Well, because they're so massive. It was. It was like he was literally scared. Because yeah. if you hit me with one of those things, I'm out right. cold. I'm done. Taylor's right. loving this episode. This is his wow. favorite episode. He's gonna listen back and make little edits. Listen, I ask this guy every time after the episode, I'm like, can I get the notes so I know what we talk? And this one, I think we're going to get pages of notes. It's going to be like, it's going to be a book report. (laughs) Everyone that is listening should go buy Laura's book. I know you're going to like it. Both of them, Idiots and Idiot. Idiot is first. Idiot's first. And then Idiots. It's so good, you guys. You will not be able to put it down. I think even Michael and Taylor are going to buy it. Where can everyone find you, your book, Pimp Yourself Out? Hey, listen, you are a phenomenal guest. She's a phenomenal. Do you want to come back on? I had more questions. I would absolutely love to. I actually have more questions. This so enjoyable. I want to know more about your career and how you built it and manifested it, but I had to ask you about the massage parlor first. Totally. That's a more interesting story, if we're honest, than my career. (laughs) Okay. Your career is incredible. We yeah. can come back on about your career. Yeah. Okay. Okay. That's fine. So where can everyone find you? We covered a lot Go of follow. ground here today. We really did. Yep. We really did. Where can I, everyone find your birth? Yeah. So anywhere, any, your favorite social media, I'm probably on there. What's your favorite social media, by the way? My favorite platform? Yeah. Podcasting. Okay, yeah, podcasting by and, far. Okay, because it's nothing to do with the way you look. Wow. Or it's just like you I just talk. That. It's so, oh, it's so nice. But you've been doing this for a long time, right? Six years. Wow, a long time. And it started from a blog. It started from a blog in college. In college, yeah, I did my research. You did your research. Thank you. I'm kind of wondering. And you guys what, met in high school. We met when we were in twelve. Twelve. Oh we haven't been, right, that's been that's together right, that long. That's right. That's right. It's like it was childhood. It's like a lot, a lot of stuff in between there. I have questions about you guys. One day I'll write a book. Yeah. Oh my God! I'll call I'm it more. You haven't. <laughs> love, love, love. Honestly, though, you are invited back to talk about your career. There's so many different ways we could have taken this interview. It was like so good. And Michael gets mad, but you should have a podcast. You think so? I think so. Pretty damn good. Well, I'll tell you why. There's a lot of duds, right? There's a lot of people that like shouldn't. And She's so, pretty good at podcasting. And I, when I say you're a phenomenal guest, I mean, not only are you a phenomenal guest, but you are a phenomenal storyteller. Yes. Oh, and you are very you. good at this. Naturally. Thank you. I'll tell you off so air. I, I had one for a minute and then I just like stopped. It was like years ago. So I was thinking about doing it, bringing it back and doing it right. But I do feel like it's a good progression and I do like what you said about well you say it doesn't matter how you look but it's a video there's a video podcast too so yeah that, that but is it's, an element. it's different you, you're not like looking at it's, yourself and yes. editing and like putting Paris filter on it yeah, it's like Paris. or tagging it's <laughs> it's like kind of just like mm. it, you get what you get it's, love I don't look at the video yeah you know what I, I don't know it's different I love that I don't care I don't care as much how I look on video with podcasting as I do on like Inst- it's it's and what weird. is your audience is it millennial women M- millennial women okay yeah. same okay <laughs> <laughs> similar audience I well, bet we have a lot of shares a lot of moms yes a lot of moms yeah so anywhere t- TikTok is my current fave I love it oh I gotta I go look at you on TikTok love it. I it's know. so much fun it's I'm so addicted much work. Is it work? You yeah, think? I got to talk to you. Well, you if you don't tips. like it, it's don't do it. Okay. You know, I have fun with it. But TikTok, Instagram, whatever, dude, wherever. Just Google my name. Get her You'll book, find you guys. It. My book's anywhere. You so can good. Amazon Prime it or download it. The Audible. I think the audio is a better experience personally, but it's fun. Some people like reading, reading. Like, do you prefer reading, reading? I read it on a Kindle. Yeah. yeah. Well, huh? I think like I prefer reading, reading because yeah. so many people 
phone in the audio version, but if you oh. actually did it yourself with your voice, oh, then yeah. I think that's, you know what I mean? Like when they get like that robot yes. author and it's, then yeah, no, like, no, no, we can't do a robot. We can't do a robot. A lot of people just no. phone in the audio because they don't want to do the We need the, the German work. accent. No, this is a full fucking performance. Laura, you're amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you. so much you for coming are. on. Thank you.